Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Get Jashed. This week you have me. I am Jess Jash. I am the host. I haven't explicitly introduced myself here. If you listen on the podcast, you have probably heard the intro um, that I've attached to the audios there. If you only watch the videos, you may have seen other things about me on socials as you found me or anything like that. But basically, I started this series because I wanted to normalize how we communicate and how we lead and bring it into a realm where it isn't purely up to any particular scholarly level or management level to be the only people who do this. It is really about how we lead ourselves first and foremost and how we communicate and have this awareness of ourselves and with ourselves so that we can then share that with others and build healthier interactions with the people around us. So I wanted to normalize that by creating this and I feel like it was a good time at episode 23 to bring me in and have a little sharing about what has come up with each guest as far as this common thread and add a little bit to that. So one thing that I have noticed in pretty much every single interview or conversation that I've had with every single guest, what comes up consistently time and time again is the idea of having courageous conversations. Sometimes it's said a little bit differently. The words courageous conversations aren't necessarily used, but in essence, that's what it's all about. That's what it comes down to. And I feel like that speaks a lot to our fears of sharing maybe what it is that we want or what it is that's bothering us or whatever the reason is, a lot of it comes down to fears or fears of not knowing where the response is going to be or what the response is going to be or how we then handle that. So we kind of try to pre-plan the conversation and the outcome of the conversation and the response rather than just showing up. I say just, it's not as easy as just until you get to that point, but rather than showing up and saying what it is that we need to say or expressing what it is that we need to express or asking what it is that we need to ask and then kind of trusting the unfolding of the conversation from there. And that is something that I know I have dealt with personally as far as what has made it feel like my voice is literally stuck in my throat Like I can't get it out and no matter how much I want to, I just keep getting caught up in that loop of, I don't know what happens next. And often that is the case of when that has come up for me, it's about, well, I don't know what happens next once I say this, or I don't know what their response is going to be or how they'll react or what they'll, another one, what they'll think of me once I do this and I find and I found in the conversations that we've had so far in every other episode there is an element of that at play some guests have shared how they've worked through it or learnt um, to approach that other guests have shared other stories around how they've realized other people have learnt to approach that with them or in the aspect of leadership, some guests have shared how they realized that was the only way that they could lead effectively was to have these courageous conversations and come from a place of heart. And I know Dr. Hannah McDougall, McDougal, she is in one of the earlier episodes, she speaks to that really eloquently as well, speaking that courage comes from the heart. So when we converse and when we share and when we connect, even in a workplace setting, in your personal, into, in your personal relationships, any of that, when we connect from the heart and speak from the heart, that is the only way that we can lead both ourselves as well as lead each other. So how do we, 
how do we move through that? Because we can know all this stuff, right? We can know all these things. Um, and I know for ages, for years, I'm like, yeah, but I know this. It doesn't mean that you immediately are able to follow through on it or practice it. And it, it doesn't immediately land. And I think one thing, if nothing else, it was partly my intentions for these, uh, for these conversations and for this series as well, but also it's shown up in the conversations, which is perfect, you know, when you have an intention and then it just shows up without you trying for it, you know, like it just shows up in the conversation. That's kind of the dream, but is the one thing is that this is all a practice. You don't become good at communicating or leading without practicing it. You don't become good at communicating or leading without screwing up. It's, it's, it's such, <laughs> this is such a cliche example, but it's like riding a bike, right? You don't just hop on a two wheeler and then get going. That's never the way that you learn to ride a bike. You put your training wheels on first. Usually you start with a tricycle, not even a bicycle, a tricycle, but you put your training wheels on first. You try it out. You get the feeling of it, but with your safety net, you practice. Maybe you have someone there, a grown up who is, in this case, if you're a child learning to ride a bike, a grown up who is guiding you, ready to catch you. So you feel safe to try it. And I think that is one of the main things that comes through actually in any of anything I teach, whether it's communication, whether it's well-being or yoga or coaching, it's about the importance of having that safe space and having that safety net, not to fall back on, not to not try, but so that you feel safe to try. And it's one thing that my my dear friend and my yoga teacher, she also used to teach acro yoga. She's one of the one of the first qualified acro yoga teachers in Australia. Stacy Louise, she always taught, especially in acro yoga, that the spotters are the most important. And it's not necessarily because they don't, they believe that the person's going to fail, the, the pair, the base and the top person, the flyer are going to fail. It's more that when the spotters are in place and close and arms are ready, not touching, but arms are ready, the flyer and the base have more courage. They have more courage to try a transition or to try a certain move than they would have if the spotter was, you know, standing back or not really paying attention or wasn't really there at all. And that is something that really resonates for me. It really lands for me because I felt that in like the literal acro yoga spotter base flyer sense i felt the difference what it's like to be especially a flyer because you're you're being held up by someone's legs and hands um or potentially just legs and i felt that literal sense of this the support from the spotters and the courage that comes from okay well if this doesn't quite go to plan i'm gonna be caught i'm safe I'm safe to try it because if it doesn't go to plan, the worst thing that will happen is that I get caught by the spotters and we just come out a little bit awkwardly. Cool. Okay. I can handle that because I'm safe. I'm not going to fall flat on my face because I'm going to be caught. I have people around me. I have things around me. I have safety mechanisms around me that don't hold me back. They're not limiting beliefs. They're not limiting mechanisms. They are safety. They don't hold me back, but they allow me to step into my courage. So I feel like that analogy can be really, really useful for how we step into life from there. 
can be really, really useful about how we approach new skills. So communication, for example, I didn't, I'm still learning, by the way, just so that we are all very, very clear. I may train it, I may teach it, but I am still learning through my own process because we never actually stop learning. But I didn't get to the point that I'm at with the understanding of it that I have now without practicing it and without having guidance and without, you know, listening to things or reading books. And I'm by guidance, I don't necessarily just mean coaching, but hi, also coach, but, <laughs> or training, official training. I mean, guidance is just listening and hearing how other people do it and maybe emulating that in my own voice and trying that out. So listening to podcasts, for example, reading books, but I didn't get to this level of understanding that I have right now in this moment. And remember that understanding isn't complete. I don't think it ever completes itself, but I didn't get to this level of understanding without trying it, without actually studying it. You know, so to be clear, I studied, <laughs> um, I went to university and studied a Bachelor of Media and Communication and a Bachelor of Business in Public Relations, which in my perspective is all about connecting with the public, connecting, building connections and relationships with others. So I started my study probably there, officially. And then I honed it in, obviously. So I learnt to teach yoga and that's a very specific kind of communication because you're directing people but while creating a safe space. And then I studied trauma-informed yoga because I feel like all yoga should be trauma-informed anyway because you don't know who's going to walk into your class. And then not necessarily in this order, sometimes some of it was overlapping. I went, I've been to therapy. I went to therapy for a few years, not because anything was wrong, but because I just felt myself hitting these blocks, these same blocks, these same internal blocks and... I had taken myself as far as I could and I realized, okay, well, I kind of need a little bit of direction or a little bit of guidance, or I just need a different perspective, someone to teach me what to do next or not even what to do next, what to do with this, what to do with this right here that I keep hitting up against. And I don't love the idea of anything being in a position to hold me back. I love the idea of kind of being prepared in that way of, you know, there's nothing that is going to get in my way um, that can stop me from feeling how I want to feel or from achieving what I want to achieve. And I don't mean that in like a Tony Robbins kind of way. I just mean that in a realistic everyday life kind of way. If I'm feeling shitty about something, I'm not going to just sit there. I'll probably sit there for a little bit and, whatever, go through the process, but I'm not actually going to let that be a long, long-term effect of my life. So you can imagine this whole pandemic has been really interesting as well, because there's a lot that you can't control with that. But I digress. I went through therapy and that's where I learned a lot of my communication and self-awareness skills. So that kind of tied in a lot of my emotional intelligence understanding. So it was building and building and building and building and maybe something I'd been naturally drawn to that whole time. However, having these conversations with my therapist, trying things on, having these understandings and these learnings, um, really helped me to start tying it in to something that was practical that I could use that I could put into practice for myself so notice that word again practice so much practice and then I just continued from there I kept going so there's more things but you get the idea that it's not something that I just decided, oh, I want to do this or I want to be good at this and then it landed. That's absolutely not the way it worked at all. It took inadvertent practice. Like sometimes you don't even realize that you're building a skill set or that you're learning new things until you kind of reflect back and go, huh, 
so there it is. You know, you don't always realize sometimes a lot of it is inadvertently learning and that's okay. Cause that's life too. You don't have to sit there and decide, all right, well, to be a good human being from now on, I'm going to decide to master emotional intelligence. Like, holy shit, to master something they say is, what, 10,000 hours, which I think breaks down to full-time hours, about four years, something like that. Someone will let me know if it's incorrect. But, you know, that's a lot. And that's a lot of pressure when you're already trying to live your life and when you already have your own shit going on, you already have your own career or your own goals or your own family stuff, you know, it's not something that needs to be homework and it's not something that needs to be like a drain on your time and your energy, but it is, uh, they are things that comes with practice. So my point here is that you cannot build skills like this without practicing. It's like riding the bike, you practice. It's like learning to swim, you practice. Some people will take to it a lot easier and a lot quicker than others. It doesn't make you any less than, it doesn't make you really shit at it and like it's impossible. It just means that your brain might work a different way. And we know that through science, we know that different biologies and then layering things like epigenetics and how your body formed in the womb will determine where the dominance of focus is on your dermal level. So that actually will shift how your brain works and where the dominance of focus is on your brain activity. There's a lot to go into there. Again, I do coaching in this area as well, but that is why it will take some people a different amount of time to others to build these skill sets. That is why it, some people are drawn more to certain things than others. That is why, you know, we all respond differently to different climates and environments and different living situations and different social situations and different work because we will all respond differently. So don't be disheartened if you're not quite grasping it or if you just don't see if it's not like a priority even doing things like listening to, to podcasts or watching videos like this is really useful. It doesn't ask you to sit down and do homework. It just kind of gives you real life examples. So getting back to the courageous conversations, that takes practice as well. Courage can be either embraced fully by some people or in some situations, or it can be scary because Brene Brown definitely talks obviously a lot about courage and shame and everything, but in her work, she's shared that, you know, courage can't exist without fear. So courage isn't the absence of fear, but courage comes out of fear. Because if we don't fear something and we're doing it anyway, it doesn't really require courage to follow through on it, right? So consider that as well when it comes to your courageous conversations. And the other thing that's really come through is about in these courageous conversations, they're not just for the sake of giving yourself a medal or, you know, ticking a box and saying, oh, look, I can have courageous conversations. Yay me. It is really about where our values lie in our connections with others, how we want to experience our connections with others, how we want to experience our work lives, because our work lives will generally always involve dealing with other people to some extent how we want to experience our personal lives, our families, our partners, our kids, how we want to experience those interactions and how we want to be in those interactions and give other people, the, the other people permission to be in those interactions with us. So that's what courageous conversations really come down to. It's not about being perfect. It's not about knowing it all. It's just about trying it. 
and practicing it and seeing how you go with that. And there are so many uncomfortable kinds of conversations that can come up even in everyday, I'm not even talking big level, I just mean everyday kind of conversations that come up that make us realize how much courage we sometimes need. Sometimes those uncomfortable conversations are things like apologies, um, whether you are giving the apology or receiving the apology, there is still courage required in that. It takes courage to give, a, give an apology for several reasons. It's courage to admit that you could do better or courage to admit that even if your intentions were there and were solid, that somehow it translated wrong and the other person was hurt in some way by it. Courage to admit that it didn't go as well as we wanted it to. It takes courage to apologize. Some people over apologize. Um, I have been guilty of this habit before as well. Just saying sorry for stuff that is inconsequential, like at the grocery store and you're standing there looking at something on the shelf and someone wants to get in, you're doing something and it's not like you're, you want to turn around and be an asshole about it, but you're doing something you're doing, you know, you're doing your stuff there. You're looking at the things on the shelf and you're just like, okay, you're trying to decide. But so often we might turn around and be like, Oh, sorry. You know, I'm in your way because we're taking up space, but we're doing something for ourselves. So inconsequential apologies aside, it can take courage to apologize, but it can also take courage to receive apologies it's really uncomfortable sometimes to receive apologies because it means admitting to the other person that we don't actually feel great about maybe their behavior or what they've said or whatever the thing is, right? So there is courage in actually admitting that. Sometimes as people pleasers, if you have ever identified with being a people pleaser, um, Sometimes receiving apologies in that instance is super, super challenging because again, we don't want to make the other person feel uncomfortable. That's as people pleasers, that's the opposite of what we want. We don't want to make the other person feel put out. We don't want to burden them with our feelings about things because, oh my goodness, how dare we have feelings about things. And it's not the other person that's saying that most of the time. It's usually just us. So even things like that require courage. And I encourage you, it's a new understanding of the word encourage. Hey, when we encourage someone, we're not having the courage for them. It's like empowering. When we encourage someone, we are saying, I like, this is welcome. Your courage is welcome to do whatever the thing is. Apologies was just the example of uncomfortable conversations. There are many more. Um, some are around, it takes courage actually to look at responsibility to and for and really stand in that. Um, I think that's a little bit more of the people pleasing once again is when we get so caught up in, again, wanting to hold space for other people, we can hold space, but we are not responsible for how they react. We cannot pre-plan or anticipate, we can try, but we cannot adjust ourselves based on how someone else reacts or especially if we're speaking from our truth and with kindness and compassion, or we cannot put it on ourselves how someone else is reacting. That is responsibility for, we are not responsible we are not responsible for someone else's reactions or emotions however there's the responsibility to we are responsible to how we show up so if we're going to show up like an asshole we are responsible to that and then we're not responsible for the fact that the other person may not like that and they may leave good on them if they do 
you know, so it's that balance of responsibility to and for, and so often we step into responsibility for other people and their experience when that's not our job. Can you imagine we're only, we're only like, we're already carrying our own experience and trying to wade through that. And sometimes the avoidance of sitting with that is to be responsible for, or try to be responsible for another person's experience as well. So we, instead of putting our attention on ourselves and our own experience, we will turn around and put our attention on other people's experience instead. And that's a lot. It's a lot of our energy and it's also ultimately useless because it's not our job. So that is an uncomfortable conversation and it takes courage to turn around and stand strongly with love and with compassion in that. It takes courage to be like, hey, you know, and if we blend the two together in apologies, right? It's not just saying, I'm really sorry that you were hurt by that and not taking accountability, but it is acknowledging that they were hurt by it without owning it. So there's a, such a balance and it's nuanced and it will shift and it will change from scenario to scenario. But these are examples of where courage shows up in regular everyday discomfort in conversations. Um, a lot of it is courage to ask for your worth, for your value, or sending an invoice that feels really big, even though you've done the work, or asking for what you want requires courage. Because if we are also asking another person because they need to come to the party in some way to for us to receive what we want, then that can feel really big and scary and does require courage. But courage, but that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It doesn't mean that it requires courage because it's bad. It just means it requires courage sometimes because we're stretching ourselves right to the edges of our comfort zone and stepping to the uncomfort zone where there is discomfort. And there is a little bit of, oh, I don't know what this is because our brains are always trying to keep us safe. However, that is where the growth happens. Like we had to do that when we learned to ride a bike. Oh, I don't know if I'm safe because I'm on two wheels. What if I fall? What if I scrape my knee? Oh, you know, or when we learn to swim. It's like, oh, you mean I have to get into this middle of the pool of water and keep myself afloat without hanging on? And I know that, you know, as babies, we inherently already know how to swim and all of that. But there is courage when we have cognitive processes with things. Courage is required for new things. So communication is one of those. And it can be labeled, labeled as a soft skill because it's not like a hard tangible skill, like a trade or anything. But I feel like that kind of lets down the perception of how important it is, how useful it is to be so in the mode of normalizing, practicing it, not even normalizing, being good at it, normalizing, practicing it and know that the more that you normalize practicing it, the more you give other people permission to do the same. And then they can practice it back with you. Because if, like, if you've ever been in a conversation where you might be actively practicing something and the other person just is throwing this wall up, it's frustrating, it can hurt, or it can just feel disheartening because you, what, what do you do from there? Whereas the more that you show up, the more that you try a thing, it could even be bringing in certain words into conversations without making a big deal out of it. So rather than saying, I think all the time, right? It could be, I feel. And you might notice then over time, the people that you've just subtly thrown those words into conversation start to talk more like that because they are getting in touch with how they feel. Courage begets courage. And it's so powerful to 
allow that for yourself. But then we come to the leadership part because it's so powerful to then lead by example. Leadership is done so much better and so much more effectively when we lead by example, as opposed to when we tell people what they should be doing. Because that's not our place to either. Even in when we even when we are leading effectively, leading by example doesn't mean that people need to do exactly as we're doing, but it does mean that we are showing the example of what it means to do what feels right for you and what feels aligned with you. So other people can lead their own example with what feels aligned with them. So courageous conversations. There is so much to them, but if nothing else, let this serve as a reminder of how much you don't need to be perfect at it, how much you don't need to have studied it as such, um, and how much you don't need to be even in a certain kind of position at work or whatever to practice it, and how much it is just practice, but also how much it then expands open the possibilities within your interactions, how you can show up and feel fuller in yourself rather than feeling like you need to filter aspects of you out or hide aspects of you or compartmentalize. So many people at work, for example, are one very different person than they are outside of work. And yes, there's a difference between, you know, you be professional, everything like that, but it doesn't mean it has to change you, that you have to be someone that you are not. So be courageous, know that you are held even if you screw up, know that you can reach out for help and guidance, like, hi, in a coach or in a course, or even if it's got nothing to do with that particular topic, having someone hold space for you generally helps you start to learn more about that in how you can show up but know that you can create the environment in which you feel held and safe to try safe to try the new thing and that it will serve you so much because you will ultimately feel more understood and the people around you will feel more heard and understood as well and then you can just focus on that connection building rather than getting so caught up in these blockades and these facades that we even unintentionally have. So yes, be courageous, know that you're safe and supported as you do so and simply let yourself practice.